video games are actually really good for us. Um, uh, you say doctors should be playing them. Well, so surgeons that play video games or um, laparoscopic surgeons that play video games are actually about 60% faster and 40% more accurate than those that don't. Right? And these are first-person shooter video games. These aren't just like Tetris and things like that. Um, there's been studies with um, more studies with first-person shooter video games um, recently that Daphne Bavillier in Rochester, the Brain Institute, did, and they found that kids that play first-person shooter video games um, have the visual acuity of someone who's deaf, and that they um, have faster hand-eye coordination. Uh, they can be better at taking certain types of tests. The contrast ratio in their eyes is is, is much better, and, and a long, long list of other things. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, and what, uh, what the, the, these research shows is that, that vi video games are actually a, a really impressive narrative. And, um, and I think that what, uh, what we kind of get caught up in is it's something we're not used to and we become afraid of it. And, um, and, and th there was a friend of mine who went to, to, to Europe this summer and he said to, uh, he, he took his son and he was really excited that he, they were going to France and they were going to, to Normandy and he was going to tell them all about the war and what happened. And he did all this research and he got all these books and everything. And they get to the beach, and his son's like, oh, this is where the British came over, and this is where the Germans were. And he described this entire thing. He kind of like acted it out. And he's like, how the hell do you know this? And he's like, oh, Call of Duty too," <laughs> Because it's all accurate. It's all, it's all. So, so my argument in the book is, is why can't, why do we all have to, if, in a history class, why do we all have to go in and open up this book and plod through this, this really kind of mundane experience? Why couldn't kids play a video game to learn about um, their history class? Um, it doesn't mean that they don't read books for literature and other things, but for that experience, it, it may make more sense. So that's kind of something that I kind of look into a little bit. Plodding through a history book. But it's, I mean, who, who took history class and had, a, had a, this book that it was like, oh my God, I've got to go to history class again, right? <laughs> Why can't that be an immersive experience where, where you're in, involved in that, in that world and you actually, you know, and you ask a German, hey, what happened on this day? Like, what, what was this battle like? And he explains in this, in this kind of interactive experience, oh, we, we came over there, and this, is, this happened here, and, and we won. Or, you, I mean, I just, it, it's not, it doesn't mean that, because it's not written in a book, doesn't mean that it's not um, an immersive narrative. It, it actually is an immersive narrative. And the, the, the neuroscience around video games show that it can actually be really compelling for the brain, too. I think the most important thing is to bring a sense of urgency to what is happening. So if, if those of us who still have our jobs can also recognize that uh, leading um, a, a good life just within our own families is no longer enough. John Stewart asked me that. He said, isn't it enough to just be a good parent and a provider and just take care of your family? I said, in normal times, it is enough. But these are not normal times. These are extraordinary times. So we need to add to whatever we're doing something that is about giving back, something that is about contributing, whatever that may be. And if it is also connected with our passion, if it is connected with something that really moves us, it's going to be more powerful. And, and I feel that this will both increase the chances that we won't be a third world America, but that we will actually find this new normal and this value reset. And it will also bring more meaning to our own personal lives because everybody who has done that can testify to the fact that their life is richer, uh, has more purpose, and is uh, and more significance. And ultimately, we all have that in our DNA. I write in the book, and maybe that's a good place to end, uh, about the fact that most biologists and psychologists talk about three instincts, mm -hmm. you know, survival, sex, and power. And I argue that there is a fourth instinct, and that's the instinct to find meaning in life, to make sense of life, to make life about something more than just ourselves. And so that instinct is there. When we tap into it, then we are more engaged, more creative, and happier. Not bad. And I think that marketing determines our culture more than culture determines our marketing. It is a, the sort of unnoticed but always seen lever that changes the way lots of things happen. When the internet came along, most people looked at it and said, great, this is TV where you can run free ads. And lots of marketers built websites, lots of marketers put up basically 
free banner ads. Lots of marketers push to have rich media slamming in your face because their greedy, selfish mindset was, we have money, we have a product, who can we interrupt, who can we push to go buy it? And I looked at that and realized that that wasn't going to scale. And to this day, there isn't anyone who has successfully built an engine where they can spend lots of money interrupting people who don't want to hear from them and turn around and reliably make money back. That's the engine of TV. TV exists for that reason. It's the only reason there's TV is because every time an advertiser spends a dollar, for 50 years they made two. And so it scaled. And that's not what happened on the internet. And we always think that the exceptions, the, the Googles and the AOLs and the Amazons and everybody else, those are the exceptions. And we're just waiting for you know, Revlon or Estee Lauder to figure out how to slam ads that smell so that we'll turn around and, and buy perfume online. It's never going to happen because that's not what the internet is. It's a connection machine. And connection can't be one-sided. It can't be, I'm here, you may now assault me with your ads. Because when that happens, we just leave. We couldn't leave when there were only three channels of TV. We couldn't leave when we're in the car driving by a billboard on the highway. We're trapped. But on the internet, we're not trapped. So I thought about that really long and hard when I started uh, Yo-Yo Dine, which is the company where we met, and realized that permission marketing was not just felt morally better or ethically better, but it actually was going to work. That if you want to hear from someone, you are more likely to listen to them. That seems really obvious.